with the especially the last couple of days, uh, this week's been kind of ugly for tech. And uh, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about has growth run its path, was COVID. Are you seeing any similarities to the dot-com era 2000? And if so, what are they? If not, what are the differences? I'm seeing some similarities. I'm seeing some differences. Okay. Um, number one, um, valuations in both periods got to what I would call mania speculative levels. Okay. Um, monetary policy was part of the issue in 99 when Greenspan decided he wanted to run, run an experiment um, where he'd let unemployment go below levels where it had historically been. It's nothing like the crazy stuff we're doing now, but that helped set it up. But what was really going on back then, I mean, think about the fact that Netscape didn't really exist until 95. So other than some nerdy professors back in the early 80s, no one even had email. Right. Much less all the stuff we had now. So literally, the internet was just sort of being built. And the big winners in 99 were companies like Sun Micro and Cisco that were building the guts of the internet, constructing it. So what happened was the growth was so rapid as this went on and valuations combined with some easy money got baked in, baked in those growth rates as far as the art could see. But think of the internet infrastructure like the railroads 150 years ago and think of the tech stocks as a company selling railroad ties, building the guts of the internet. So once the railroad is built, while you're building the railroad, your sales are going up 50, 60, 70% a year. But once the railroad is built, um, your growth not only doesn't go up 70%, it goes down because on a rate of change basis, you don't need any more railroad ties. Um, so what none of us saw, me included, in early 2000, were a lot of these companies with estimates of 50, 60, 70% for the next two or three years, their business was literally about to collapse. So the NASDAQ went down 95%, um, not 30, 95, um, because you had this combination of inflated values, way overestimated earnings, um, out there and then earnings collapsed. So today um, you have something similar and something different. So monetary policy is absolutely insane. We had no QE back then, uh, our rates weren't zero. They were four or five when they probably should have been six or seven, no comparison. So we have an asset bubble now that's not just in tech stocks, it's in everything. SPACs, Dogecoin, although maybe some of the young uh, viewers disagree. Um, you name it, if you're an asset, you've been moving. Um, but what we also have, back then you had this incredible wave from 95 to 2000 while the internet was being built. What you have now is this incredible wave of digital transformation, particularly moving on to the cloud. And I used to say two or three years ago in some interviews, well, we're in like the bottom of the first or the second inning, and this is a 10 year runway. Um, well, COVID um, sort of jumped you from the bottom half of the first to the sixth inning, wow. not the ninth, but to the sixth. Right. I think the guy from Shopify said, we went from 2019 to 2030 um, in one year because of COVID. I think, I think it was him. I think the difference now is if, you don't, if you're a customer and you haven't moved to the cloud, you're dead because who you're competing against, they can just beat you because the technology is so important. So now... Full disclosure, I didn't see what was coming in 2000 coming, but I am really hard up to come up with a scenario while this, that this digital transformation thing is gonna collapse and these SaaS companies are gonna go away. 
And the biggest problem you have now is the overall bubble in asset prices and where price got to these names in particular. The good news is if we had had this conversation two months ago, this, the good ones were like 45 or 50 times sales, not earning sales. They're down to, there's a range I'd say now 10 to 25 times sales for the good ones. So if the problem is price, and in my opinion, that is the problem, a lot of that has been wrung out. And I think if you hold these names for three or four years, they can easily grow into their valuations where if you held the names in 2000, a lot of these companies, um, you still had losses of 90, 85, 90% of your value. Right. So those are the similarities and those are the differences. Right. So uh, to summarize, it sounds like uh, kind of the key differences would be the, uh, the monetary policy is completely different. And the, the names themselves uh, are just as a company and, and looking in, at further out in the economy, it's just the likelihood of those still existing is much higher. Yeah, the other similarity is back then, I remember a lot of value managers were <laughs> virtually going out of business right. uh, at the end of 2000. One of the greatest investors of all time, Julian Robertson, who was long value and short these crazy tech names, he basically threw in the towel and said he couldn't take it anymore and stopped managing money in early 2000. But what happened in the next three to five years was incredible. Companies like Phelps Dodge Copper Companies went up six to eight fold, six to eight times for, for the old industrial stuff. So everything Julian was long um, went up many fold and the tech stocks went down a lot. We do have some similarities there today because these COVID companies, beneficiaries, so much demand was pulled forward that they got too high and too much ownership. And as we're reopening, there's also an ownership problem where there's probably more money that needs to rotate out of the secular growers into these, I'll call them reflation names. But I do wanna say very differently, I think these things are secular growers and they'll probably be fine long-term. Amazon at 3,200, um, is not a bubble stock, not, not whatsoever. It's basically decent value. Right. And I don't just mean Amazon, but a lot of the, like the big tech so-called names. things names, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, just as a, as a curiosity that I see, uh, I actually asked yesterday a bunch of my Twitter followers what they want to ask is, do you have an opinion of any of the thing kind of names, uh, including Microsoft, uh, who will get the five trillion first? What a great question. Um, <laughs> I've always answered that with Amazon and Microsoft. I've never really believed Apple had the innovation to take you to the next level and it was mainly a hardware company. Um, they obviously have morphed into the services app company, but as you know, I th it's funny, that's the one they don't, haven't talked about being a monopoly, but when you look at monopoly behavior, charging a 30% rent to all these, you know, little companies seems a little extreme. Whereas Amazon and Microsoft, they basically don't raise price. So my guess, my, first of all, I have no idea, but right. my number one, if you, if you put a gun to my head or we're going to Vegas um, would be Amazon and number two would be Microsoft. Okay. Um, Google could have a big pop ironically, if the government breaks them up, because their core search business is literally the best business I've ever seen. Um, but they keep trying all this experimental stuff that challenges um, shareholder value, but those guys are so rich, they're more interested in changing the world right now and good for them. Yeah, they get to do uh, uh, mushrooms, go to the desert and just think about all the things they can do in their space with the moonshots, right? Well said, well said. Uh, I think the question here that Jan and RJ had put that uh, we thought would be a great follow-up was, uh, so what is the biggest risk to the equity market right now? I think you touched on some of them has to do with, uh, I guess, <laughs> the valuations and just the- Without, without, without a doubt, it's um, inflation strong enough 
that this Fed responds to it. Right. Uh, no doubt about it. Th this bubble has gone long, long enough and it's extended enough that the minute they start tightening, um, the equity market should go down a lot, um, particularly with so much of the cap weighted in growth stocks, would, which would be hit the worst. And our central case is that inflation occurs, but we're open-minded to something like 07, 08, where you never really got to the inflation because the bubble popped. So the inflation never got to the manifestation stage. That would be the second one. In terms of geopolitical stuff, it's become a popular view, but um, I'm worried about Taiwan. And uh, I think it's probably not a worry until after the Beijing Olympics. Right. I don't think um, Xi Jinping wants to deal with sanctions and oh, boycotts oh and all that. But I can't imagine um, he's not going to try something right. um, post the Beijing Olympics. And I don't think that's big stuff. That's not some little thing where Yemen is fighting Saudi Arabia. If he, if you were to get worried about the United States and China, that could be an exogenous event. Right. It could get quite nasty. Absolutely. So to summarize then, the, in, the inflation concern and the Fed tightening is kind of a big risk. Longer term out is just Taiwan is actually a massive hot spot. And uh, post-2022, the, the Winter Olympics, there, there's opportunity for something to happen. That's our, that's our central case. As you know, I tend to change my mind. But okay, absolutely. right, right now, if you're country. asking me what the biggest risks are, it would be them. Absolutely. All right, so the next one we had here is a more, more retail-oriented question, or actually not necessarily retail-oriented, but it does concern retail, is uh, do you uh, see anything from uh, as, an, as a long-term after effect of what happened earlier this year with Wall Street bets, with retail being able to congregate in one place and kind of direct money flows? I know in the past you've talked about the importance of liquidity, and do you see any long-term effects of having the ability of millions and millions of retail investors to, to put their targets on a single name? When I started in the business, retail dominated institutions. Okay. And you got most of your information from your broker. Um, the amazing thing about the, cur the current retail investor is they have access to things like Toggle. So they're actually much better informed than the retail investors were in the late 80s and early 90s. And with right. the internet, um, they have tools and the way you already mentioned, they congregate. The big risk is they're all loaded up in this stuff. You know, don't confuse uh, genius with a bull market. <laughs> and something exogenous talks like we're talking about. And they all lose enough money that they're scarred. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've always thought the Japanese investor would come back to the market in five or 10 years after the bubble burst. That was 1990 and they still haven't come back right. to the market. So I worry about scoring, but no, I think my guess is the after effect of Wall Street bets is here to stay. And they'll probably migrate away from some of the more radioactive names like GameStop. But, and I think it'll actually end up being some kind of healthy information sharing, net, sharing network. Right. So uh, you didn't mention Toggle as, as kind of a tool that can be used uh, in these environments, uh, or just in general as, a, as a, a, in, an investor's toolkit. So how different would that have been, you know, back in the 80s to have a tool like Oh, that? oh my God. If, if you had Toggle and nobody else did, you'd have absolutely <laughs> murdered their results. Right. Uh, when I started in the business, Fed watching was considered unique. And I used Ned Davis and other technical services. And I just felt I had a huge advantage right. over the general public. Um, so any tool you have like Toggle, which is clearly um, predictive of price moves, but even more interesting in this case, because of the mathematical capability of it, can analyze thousands of thousands of securities 
Right. I only have 16 hours a day and I'm not that fast of a reader. Um, so if you had a tool like that back then, it would be like my advantages plus five right. X. And the way I think about toggle is, I don't know how much you know about me, but I've always said, um, I like multidisciplines in managing money. So my first boss taught me technical analysis. So I use fundamental analysis and technical analysis. And if there's thousands of securities out there and my portfolio is only gonna consist of 15 or 20, I'm never gonna buy something that doesn't have a great chart and great fundamentals. Right. I do that. If you brought something like Toggle into that, it's just one more fantastic screening mechanism that gives me the discipline. Um, so now I've got a triple screen to um, hold or, or buy or sell securities. Right. Um, that would be invaluable. And again, to the public who doesn't have access to information I have as an institutional investor and paying tons and tons of money to consultants, something like this, the value added to them could be even more valuable than it is to me. And I find it value added. Right, absolutely. And uh, so you did mention a lot about it, your trading back in the 80s. I don't want to say back in the day, it feels kind of wrong to say that, but uh, you, uh, you've you been described as someone that has a stomach of a riverboat gambler. I literally don't even know what that means, but what I will say is, what do you think uh, are kind of the keys to a good investor, right? So just from your own experience. So when I've looked at all the investors of very large reputations, um, Warren Buffett, Carl Icahn, George Soros, they all only have one thing in common. And it's the exact opposite of what they teach in a business school. It's they make large concentrated bets where they have a lot of conviction. They're not buying 35 or 40 names and diversifying. I don't know whether you remember uh, Icahn a few years ago put $5 billion into Apple and I don't think he was worth more than 10 billion when he did that. Right. Um, when I went in to tell Soros that I was going to short 100% of the fund in the British pound against the Deutschmark, he looked at me with great disdain because he thought the story was good enough that I should be doing 200% uh, <laughs> because it was sort of a once in a once in a generation opportunity. Right. So A, they concentrate their holdings. B, concentration, this is very counterintuitive. It really gets your intention. So it actually, in my, in my thinking, decreases your overall risk. Because where you tend to be in trouble is if you have 35 or 40 names and you stop paying attention to one. If you have big, massive positions, um, it has your attention. Right. So. The way uh, my favorite quote of all time, maybe, is Mark Twain, put all your eggs in one basket and watch the basket carefully. Right. Um, I tend to think that's what great investors do. The other thing to me is you got to have to know how and when to take a loss. Right. I've been in business since 1976 as a money manager. I've never used a stop loss, not once. Dumbest concept I've ever heard. It goes down 15%. I'm automatically out. But right. I've also never hang on to a security if the reason I bought it has changed. And that's when you need to sell. If I buy X security for A, B, C, and D reasons, and those no longer are valid, whether I have a loss or a gain, that stock doesn't know whether you have a loss or a gain. It, you know, it's, it is not important. Your ego is not what this is about. What this is about is you're making money. So if I have a thesis and it doesn't bear out, which happens often with me, I'm often, I'm often wrong, just get out and move on. Because I said earlier, if you're using a most disciplined approach, you can find something else. There's no reason to hang on to any security where you don't have great conviction in it. Right, no, absolutely. So along that kind of metric where when you say what makes a great investor is kind of the, the mindset and the approach, 
What about from kind of the emotional side, like managing the emotions and the, the psychology? Oh, you're, you're, you just have to be disciplined and you're constantly fighting your own emotions. Look, I'm not going to lie to you. My first boss had this saying, the higher they go, the cheaper they look. Um, there's something weird. And I know everybody watching this has experienced this and it doesn't make any sense. But when a security goes up, every bone in your body wants to buy more of it. And when it goes down, you're fighting, making yourself not sell it. Right. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. And you have to constantly remind yourself um, why you own that security. And just because it's going down doesn't necessarily mean you should sell it. If it's going down, it definitely means you should reevaluate your thesis, but it doesn't mean you should sell it. And you cannot get crazy when it's going up. One of the, probably the biggest mistake I ever made in the business, and I knew better. Somebody asked me what I learned from this. I said, nothing, I already knew it. Um, in January of 2000, after riding that tech boom to a T and making billions of dollars in 99, I sold everything out in January and I had a couple of internal portfolio managers at Soros who didn't sell out and had these, it was a smaller portfolio, but they made 30% after I sold and I just couldn't stand it anymore. And I'm like watching them make all this money every day. And like for two days, I'm like ready to pick up the phone and buy this stuff back. And you know, there's a little devil there and then the angel and she's saying, don't do it. And he's saying, buy it. And uh, I pick up the phone and I buy them. I might have missed the top of the dot com bubble by an hour. I ended up losing three billion dollars oh. on that trade alone. I had made more the year before, but you know, three billion dollars is a lot of money. And it was all because I got emotional and dropped every tool of discipline I've ever had. And somebody says, "Well, what did you learn from it?" And I just said, "I learned nothing. I learned that 25 years ago." So you can right. talk about not being emotional. But it takes incredible discipline to, to act on that. I mean, that's an incredible. You said you started in 76, right? And that's 24 years later. You've been going through it for almost a quarter of a century and it still happened. Yep, yep, yep. So um, it's something I wanted to just uh, add on to kind of what you just mentioned was the actual approach of investing for yourself. You, you famously talked about uh, looking at what makes the stock go up and down. Uh, at a, you know, wh what does that mean specifically for yourself when you say what makes stock open now? What, what does that mean in terms of fundamentals? It, it varies from stock to stock. Right. Interesting thing about co Toggle, they'll find things that I didn't even know move the stock. Right. But if it happens over and over again, you figure it's not random. Um, so I'll never forget, I keep going back to my boss in Pittsburgh, but I was an analyst and I analyzed retail. And I come in with my earnings estimate on Kmart and my earnings estimate on this company and that. And he says, yeah, but what's going to make the stock go up? And I said, what do you mean? And he says, everybody knows what you just told me. Keep looking, keep looking. And finally, I came back. I found out at the time, by the way, this has changed since then. If you graphed the change in food and energy prices over top the retail index, it was like clockwork. Retail and food prices, I'm sorry, food and energy prices go up, retail relative stocks go down. It's not rocket science here. <laughs> if, if, you, if you take discretionary spending and you increase the cost of it, she's got less money to, to buy a dress. Um, and I watched that and it worked for 10 or 12 years and then for some reason it stopped working. But there's an analysis of fundamentals, which I completely endorse where look at the balance sheet, try and figure out a couple of years from now, what people are going to think about this company or the earnings going to be different than they think now, that kind of stuff. But then there's all the weird stuff. Like I just mentioned, the beauty of toggle is it comes up with stuff that sometimes I don't even quite understand, but frankly, I don't care if the stuff works. Right. Uh, I'm going to go with it. I'm very open-minded. I don't need, um, I don't need to totally understand something if I've seen it work over and over again. Right. Absolutely. But so, most of these things I understand. Yeah. 
So they'd be the equivalent of Toggle finding that relationship you just mentioned, right? The, the food, energy, and, and, and discretionary spending. Yeah, and the beauty of Toggle is um, I might get a notice one day that XYZ looks good. Then I can do my fundamentals. Then I can look at the chart. So it's not only a discipline in terms of buying and selling, it can also be an idea generator. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, I thought this was a good opportunity to hop into something. I kind of wanted to ask it first, but I figured it'd be better to kind of move it there. I think I know what's coming. <laughs> You're young, I can tell by the look on your face, it's crypto. Yeah, yeah 100% correct. See, I can predict the future. Yeah, and it, the talk will probably give you the alert, right? This guy's about to ask crypto. I, uh, I'm not, not going to ask you to put a price target or anything, but the, the, the question just, uh, just to throw it out there to get the conversation going is, uh, does Bitcoin have the opportunity to, the thesis is it will replace 9 trillion of gold, right? Or along those lines, or it'll match it. Do you, I mean, what is your opinion about that thesis? So, so I've evolved on this. Okay. If you've done your homework about five or six years ago, I said more than once, um, Crypto and Bitcoin are a solution in search of a problem. Right. So what the hell are these people all looking for? We already have that. It's called the dollar. Right. Okay. So for the first move in Bitcoin, I think it went from what, 50 bucks to 17,000. I just sat there aghast. And by the way, consistent with our earlier conversation, I wanted to buy it every day. It was going up, even though I didn't. I didn't think much of it. I just couldn't stand the fact that it was going up and, and I didn't own it. So um, fast forward, I, I never owned it from like $50 to 17,000, felt like a moron. Then it goes back down to 3,000 again. And then a couple things happen. And this, this is consistent with the fundamental and then let's make something go up or down. So Solution in search of a problem. I found the problem when we did the CARES Act and Chairman Powell started crossing all sorts of red lines in terms of what the Fed would do and wouldn't do. The problem was Jay Powell and the world central bankers going nuts and making fiat money even more questionable than it had already been when I used to own gold. Then the second thing that happened is I got a call from uh, Paul Jones. And he says to me, uh, do you know that when Bitcoin went from 17,000 to 3,000, 86% of the people that owned it at 17,000 never sold it? Well, this was huge in my mind. Right. Here's something with a finite supply 86% of the owners are religious zealots. I mean, who the hell holds something through 17,000 to 3,000? And it turns out none of them, you know, 86% of the people never sold it. And I had this new central bank craziness phenomena. The other thing that happened, um, it had been, you know, it had a few more years under its belt. So it goes up to 6,000 in the middle of the last spring. And I go, well, I got to buy some of this just because these kids on the West Coast that are already worth more than I am, and they're going to be making a lot more money than me in the future. For some reason, they're looking at this thing the way I've always looked at gold, which right. is a store of value if I don't trust fiat currencies. Um, and then the thing that Paul told me, and then the fact that it had been around 13 years, it had become a brand. Right. So... It's funny, I tried to buy 100 million at 6,200. It took me two weeks to buy 20 million. I bought it all around 6,500, I think. And I said, this is ridiculous. You know, it takes me two weeks. I can buy that much gold in two seconds. So like an idiot, I stopped buying it. Um, next thing I knew, uh, the thing's trading at 36,000. I took my costs and then some out of it. And I still own some of it. My heart's never been in it. I'm a 68 year old dinosaur, but once it started moving and these institutions started adopting it, 
I could see the old elephant trying to get through the keyhole and they can't fit through in time. Um, I own this company called Palantir and I see they announced with their earnings today, they're gonna to start accepting Bitcoin and they may invest it. That's happening all over the place. And you know, this thing is never gonna have more than 21 million. It's, it's, a, it's a fixed supply. So I think because it's a brand, it's been around for 14 years because of the finite supply, it has sort of won the store of value game. Is it gonna beat gold? I don't know, it sure as hell doing a good imitation of it um, the last year or two. But is it gonna beat the other cryptos in terms of digital gold store of value? I would say it's gonna be very, very tough to unseat. Then you go to what I call the uh, commerce facilitators which obviously the lead in smart contracts and that kind of stuff would be Ethereum. There, I'm a little more skeptical of whether they can hold their position. It reminds me a little of MySpace before face, Facebook came along, or maybe a better analogy, Yahoo before Google came along. Right. Google wasn't that much faster than Yahoo, but it didn't need to be all it needed to be was a little bit faster right. and the rest is history. And I'm so impressed. One of the ways we've always invested in the private sector is to try and figure out where the engineering kids from Stanford and Brown and MIT, where those kids are going. And so many of them are in love with crypto and that's where they're going. I, I'm worried about the talent that's like 23 to 28 years old somebody we don't even know who they are yet, come in up with a payment system or whatever and unseating. So again, I don't know, but my guess is um, the winner in the commerce facilitating, I'll call it, whether you want to call it payments or smart contract, or whatever we're on, there's a good chance that company hasn't even been in or that currency hasn't even been invented yet. Right. Absolutely. So Bitcoin uh, as a store of value, probably safer in the crypto space. But as you mentioned, the computing aspect, there's a lot of potential here to be unseated. You know, as long as Jay Powell <laughs> keeps acting like he's been acting, um, I think gold and Bitcoin and Bitcoin seems to be a high beta gold are going to have the wind behind them. High beta gold. That's a never heard that before. That is a fantastic uh, terminology. Well, it's so fantastic. I'm wondering why the hell I didn't just own Bitcoin two years ago instead of uh, just gold Absolutely. and a little Bitcoin. So uh, just, to, just to put the cherry on top of the crypto combo, you mentioned it once earlier, Dogecoin, is it just to you ridiculous and Elon's involvement in it? Like what, how did, what is your reaction to all that? It's just a, you know, it's like NFTs. It's just a manifestation of the craziest monetary policy in history. Right. And I think since there's no limit on supply, I don't really see the utility of this thing. Right now it's just this wave of money and the greater fool theory. Um, no, no. <laughs> just enough. Uh, now, having said that, I, I'm, I wouldn't short it because I don't like putting campfires out with my face. Um, so I just, Try and present Dogecoin doesn't exist. Right. I think so little of it, it doesn't even bother me when it goes up. Right. When right. Bitcoin used to go up, I'd go crazy that I didn't own it. When Dogecoin goes up, I just I just start laughing. But to <laughs> me, it's all about Jerome Powell. Right. At the end of the day, it goes back just to the money printer. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I like that how you you said about Doge. Where it, it's a joke. Uh, I mean, it was literally created as a joke. So for you just to look at it as a joke, that's probably the best way for everyone to look at it, right? Hey, this is a joke. Don't even consider it. It's like irrelevant. Yeah, don't go long and don't go short. And you know, unless you like going to Vegas, then I guess it's okay because it's a lot of action. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think one of the uh, one of the last questions we had here. Obviously, thank you so much for your time. Uh, the, the question we had here was: If you are twenty years old today what would you be doing as you started your career? Uh, the number one necessary con condition would be something I was passionate about. Okay. Particularly in this business, the people that love it like me are so addicted to it and so intellectually stimulated by it. 
if you're not and you're in for the money, you have no chance competing with these people. They're yeah. going to outwork you. They're going to out execute you. So, and I think it's probably true of a lot of professors, but let's not forget if you're American, you're probably going to spend 60 to 70 hours a week minimum working. If you're in your job for the money and not because you love it, you just blew 70 hours a week on the have on the happiness quotient. That's pretty rough. Right. So I would tell a 20 year old, follow your passion. I was just lucky. I followed my passion. My mother in law says I'm an idiot savant, that I wouldn't be good at anything else. But I would do this for 50,000 a year. I really would. I just, I just love it. And I hate to see young people get trapped in something. And I would also say, keep an open mind. I started uh, at Bowdoin as an English major. I took economics just so I could read the paper intelligently. I went to get a PhD in economics. And I went there and I said, these people are crazy. They're trying to shove the economy into a math formula. It doesn't make any sense. Then I went to, I worked construction for six months. I got kind of a weak upper body, so that didn't work for me. <laughs> then I went to uh, the bank and I found out what I was just in love with. And so try stuff out. And if you're not really, really engaged during the day and you're not happy, uh, move on to something else because there's, there's something out there for everybody, but I would not let money be the driver of the equation. That can lead to a lot of not maximizing what I call the happiness quotient, which right. to me is the most important quotient in your life. Well, you mentioned that you would be doing this job if you're making 50 grand a year. So the question is, will you, will you hand over the family office? When do you expect that to happen? If, if ever until- Will I what? Will the handover of the family office to another manager and you just go hands off happen in the near future? Or this is something you just want to be doing just for your own happiness question. So as you probably know, a lot of people when they retire, they start messing around in the stock market for fun. <laughs> so if they're all retiring and doing this to other 90, why am I supposed to stop doing it? What I will say is my skill set you know, I think a lot of my performance has been because I'm flexible in terms of uh, instruments I use in terms of assets. So I'm not afraid to just play in bonds or currencies or this or that. But my real passion is in macro. And I think history would say in macro, I'm probably an A plus and in equities, I'm probably a B minus. Um, equities are much more labor intensive. As you know, there's only one yen, there's only one euro, uh, treasuries. I guess my dream to your excellent question would be to find a successor to run the entire equity part of my family office. Right. But have me fiddling around in the macro and acting like the old talking head sage, uh, <laughs> and, you know, coach to him. That that's be where I'd be. But I I. I think I would die if I couldn't, if I couldn't do have some connection with the investment market and the markets during the day. I just, first of all, I'm not very good at golf. I like doing stuff I'm good at. And I think that's part of what we're talking about with passion. No one likes being a loser. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'll probably go to my grave doing this stuff, but maybe not with the control I have right now. Well, uh, just the last comment on that point is for the equity side, at least you have Pogo, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it takes a lot of the labor out, I'll tell you that. You can no, cover a lot more ground in an hour than you can trying to do normal reading. No, that's perfect. Uh, I, I, I wrapped up on my end. Those are all the questions we had. And uh, it was amazing, Stan. That was uh, incredibly insightful and uh, really appreciate your time. Hopefully this does some good for everybody.